This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Former Waffle House executive and now author, Burt Thornton, on this edition of Conversations. The Waffle House is as much a part of Southern culture as SEC football and NASCAR. Burt Thornton was part of that iconic restaurant for nearly four decades, starting as a manager trainee and climbing through the executive ranks, becoming president and chief operating officer. His imprint on the company is such that one of their popular menu items bears his name, Burt's Chili. Now retired from day-to-day -day activities with Waffle House, Thornton is intent on leaving a positive impact on up-and-comers. He recently penned a book entitled Find an Old Gorilla, Pathways Through the Jungle of Business and Life. The book zeroes in on how finding the right mentor can make a monumental difference in your life and career. We welcome Bert Thornton to Conversations. Thank you for joining us. It is a pleasure to be here, Jeff. Nice to be with you. Well, it's great to have you. I am curious, where'd you come up with the title, Find an Old Gorilla? Well, the, the title's a little crazy, but the premise is if you wake up one morning and find you have to go through a jungle, uh, it makes sense to take an old gorilla along. Uh -huh. like you or me, who knows <laughs> where the good paths are, right, and also right. the quicksand. <laughs> right. And it's pretty much the same in the jungles of business and life. Right. Uh, you need to find someone who can help you get through the, the thickets and avoid the pitfalls, and uh, that's the mentor, the old gorilla that I'm talking about. Yeah. What made you want to write a book <clears throat> about mentoring? You know, I have mentored hundreds of people uh, throughout my life, starting with my three daughters who uh, are all very successful young ladies and their friends. And in the course of my Waffle House career, um, hundreds, certainly hundreds of people. Um, I have a very active role at Georgia Tech where I went to school and have mentored students and staff and faculty alike there. <clears throat> I noticed that as I was uh, uh, mentoring these folks, I was developing a couple of files. Um, one was the file of the notes that I took in these mentoring sessions. And the second file was a file of, of articles and notes that I took when I talked to people that I res respected greatly. Those files became pretty thick. <clears throat> and I noticed that I was constantly referring to these two files in the later years of, uh, of my mentoring. And then one day I, I decided, you know, I'm never going to be able to sit down across the table from all of the people who have questions. Mm -hmm. So what I did was take those two files and condense them into uh, an easy to read, uh, user friendly uh, book, which talks about how to figure out exactly what you want in life mm -hmm. and uh, how to find the right people to help you get there. What makes a good mentor? <clears throat> great question. And the woods are full of people who think they probably are great mentors, but are not. Um, first of all, you want someone who has an interest in you, mm -hmm. a sincere interest. Um, second, you need to find a good listener. And the really critical traits for a good mentor is this person has to have a solid track record of success. I mean, if not, why would you listen to them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you need somebody with a solid track record of success and somebody who has a specific expertise in the area of your interest. <clears throat> and then the last and most important trait, I feel, is um, peer respect. Uh, if you are and here's a tip, the greater the respect for your mentor by his or her peers, the greater your chances of success, because that seems to be the litmus test. Mm -hmm. After all the conversation is over, um, if the folks that this person rubs shoulders with say, it's a great gal or a great guy and knows what he or she's talking about, that's the litmus test for a great mentor. If I'm a young person and I want to find a mentor, and maybe I identify somebody that's been really successful in that field, um, how do I go about connecting with them? Because 
a lot of times people think, well, they won't want to talk to me. I'm just a college kid or I'm just a, a rookie in the business. Your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are that um, I know you mentor a lot of people yourself and you and I both are on the lookout for potentially successful people who just need a little nudge or need a little across the table, hey, this is what you really need to be thinking about. So the answer to your question is you simply ask. And I say in the book, um, don't be shy. When you find someone that you think can help you, go up to them and say, hey, would you mind having a cup of coffee with me and talking about what I'm trying to get done? And you would be surprised, they'll be delighted. I, I, I've told people before that sometimes the more successful someone is, the more likely they are to be open to have that cup of coffee at the Waffle House on an early Monday morning <laughs> or something. Exactly, that's where a lot of my mentoring sessions occur. Um, but yes, uh, my daddy used to say, it's, it's not so important what you have, but what you leave behind. Right, right. And it's important for successful people to have good coattails. Absolutely. And let other people ride them. Yeah. So, so we kind of established what a good mentor is. What's a good mentee? What makes a good mentee? Yeah, again, in the book, um, I very clearly state that a mentee has uh, responsibilities as well. Uh, you have to come prepared. You, you can't just show up at the party and say, you know, help me. Right. Uh, you have to know what you're trying to get done, um, and you have to do your homework uh, and make sure that your mentor is in sync with what you're trying to get done. And then you, you listen, and the mentee's responsibility is to understand that it's his or her meeting. And he or she should drive that meeting and ask all the really critical questions. Don't make the mentor guess what you're thinking. Once this relationship gets established, how do you go about um, establishing accountability? Well, the second half of that last question is, is actually this question. Once, once you start mentoring, and you don't need to mentor every day or really uh, probably every week to get started. After that, you, you string it out a little bit. Um, and when things come up, as they do in business, um, it's okay to call and say, hey, something crazy is going on. C can we chat for a second? And it's important to say thank you to your mentor because when you're unhappy, your mentor frowns, and when you're happy, your mentor smiles. They're there to, to help make you successful. So the accountability part is the feedback that you give to your mentor um, because just because you think things are working, your mentor may have a different opinion. So there's some accountability on both sides. The mentor to make sure this person is going in the right direction and the mentee to give honest feedback about what he or she is encountering out there in the workplace or in the family. Who are some of your mentors? My dad was my first. Um, he was just a wonderful, wonderful fellow, great personality. Um, he taught me a lot of things. Um, integrity was one of them, uh, which has uh, been a very good thing f for me over the years. Um, there are a lot of folks out there who, uh, who don't really um, play that game right. Mm. But <clears throat> Daddy, uh, he, w he always harped about honesty. <clears throat> Excuse me, and he always um, was just a jovial, spirited guy, and um, I, I picked that up for him. I picked up the ability to get along with pretty much everybody, all walks of life, in any uh, kind of endeavor. Uh, that's sort of the social side. The business side, the uh, founder of the company is a fellow named Joe Rogers Sr., and we call him Pop. He's He's uh, 97, his mm. co-founder, Tom Fortner, is 98, and they still are going strong. Um, but Joe uh, Sr., uh, Pop's son, Joe Rogers Jr., and I were fraternity brothers at Georgia Tech. Okay. 
And so we all got out. I went into the Army. I was an artillery officer. Um, I had the two extremes. Uh, I had a wonderful year in Miami and a not so great year in Vietnam. <laughs> and then when I got back, I went to work for NCR in their IT division, although at that time we didn't know enough to call it IT. It was called electronic data processing back when the earth was still cooling. <laughs> tell, tell her, for those who don't know, tell, explain NCR, the company. Oh, NCR is National Cash, cash Register. Register. Yeah. They, they started in the cash register business, but when they got into the computer business, uh, I was a systems analyst and, and a, a salesman with their fledgling uh, Century uh, series computers. But anyway, uh, loved the computer business, but uh, didn't like the big corporate hassle. And I got a call from my fraternity brother who said, hey, we're getting into the Waffle House business. Uh, why don't you come on up and uh, take a look? And I did. And the next thing I knew, I was flipping eggs and turning hamburgers. <laughs> and uh, and so that's 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 kind of how I got into the business. And um, Joe was president, and I was learning the business. And he really was my uh, second great mentor. Um, he was sort of plowing through the jungle on his own and um, pulling me behind him, uh -huh. saying, steer right, steer left, I've been there, that's not working. Um, and I, I, I paid attention to him. He's, he is a great uh, businessman uh, and, and well-known in the state of Georgia for his uh, business expertise, former chairman of uh, Children's Health Care and um, another, a, a number of, of other things. Uh, I think uh, Nathan Deal uh, went to him when Governor Deal, mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. he was trying, when he got elected and was trying to get uh, uh, business right in the state of Georgia. So he has great coattails. Right. Joe was a great guy to listen to. Right. When you first went to work for Waffle House, how many restaurants did they have? You know, <clears throat> under a hundred. Um, and I don't really remember exactly how many. I remember the first one I opened was number 99. Okay. But <clears throat> my sense of it is that there were much less than that. And of course, today we have uh, over 2,000 restaurants in 25 states. And actually, uh, about 300 restaurants in what you and I would call metropolitan Atlanta. 300 in mm -hmm. Atlanta. Mm -hmm. There is wow. uh, literally one on every uh, substantial corner. Yeah. And in some places, uh, Two people say, "Well, why, why don't? Why didn't you build them bigger?" And the answer is, uh, <clears throat> when we found out we should have, we just go across the street and build another one, <laughs> and that's called a double up. In some places, there are triple ups. And at one time in Orlando, by Disney World, we had about five in a line. So um, that that's kind of our uh, expansion theory. What is the secret sauce of Waffle House? What has made that company so successful? Oh, it's the experience. I mean, um, there's nothing like it. Uh, people, a very common question for me is, uh, who's your competition? And the answer is, well, it depends on the time of day and it depends on the person, but, um, you know, generally McDonald's, but that's, that's not a sit down experience. Right. Um, um, IHOP, but their prices are kind of crazy. Uh, you know, 10, 15 or more percent higher than ours, and it's still not the same experience. When you walk into a Waffle House and it's crowded and the orders are flying and the jukebox is playing Raisins in My Toast <laughs> and you see all your friends, it's just, it's kind of a down home experience. I'll tell you a funny story. I was in uh, Kansas City one time working the restaurants in Kansas City. And I walked in and it was 10 o'clock in the morning and all the blinds were down. Well, we don't like that. Uh, we want it to be wide open. So I, I asked uh, the manager, I said, what's, what's the deal with the blinds? And he said, see the, the man and his son in the booth over there, um, they are from St. Louis. And they're visiting in Kansas City, but the son is very homesick. And so the father decided to bring him to 
to the Waffle House and let the blinds down, and he's pretending he's in his own Waffle House back in St. Louis, and he's very happy. I said, leave the blinds down. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great thing you're doing. How did you guys decide where you wanted to put restaurants? I mean, we, we primarily think of the restaurants being in the South and South, you know, Texas and whatnot, but how, how did you make the decision of where, where you want to be and what part of the country? Well, um, of course, we, we, we dominate the Southeast and absolutely own Atlanta. Um, but we started in Georgia. Pop and Tom started in Avondale Estates. That's where number one, we number them when we build them. And that's where number one was. It's now a museum, a Waffle House Museum, as a matter of fact. And 400 yards to the east is, um, is number 1,000. Um, but the main thing is, is to find a geographical area market <clears throat> that has great need. Um, that's the key word on our real estate check sheet. Is there a need for a Waffle House here? So you decide that there's an area that needs Waffle Houses, for example, um, Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So then you go to Kansas City, uh, the real estate team does, and starts looking for uh, geographical areas that, that make sense for us, and then they decide within those geographical areas what the predominant choices are. And they actually develop a strip map that says number one choice, number two choice, number three choice. <clears throat> About that time, um, they make sure that the, uh, the chairman who controls uh, where these Waffle Houses are built and, and you know, wh what's gonna work and what's not gonna work, or the CEO actually is a fellow by the name of Walt Amer right now, and I think that responsibility has fallen to him. Um, he gives an early warning back that says, hey, I, don't waste your time or pursue it. Right. <clears throat> and they go in and then do the due diligence, and then they start trying, they start with number one and say, uh, we'd like to buy this location, and they start negotiations. If that doesn't work, they go to number two. And eventually, um, we map that particular area with Waffle Houses in the right strategic locations. I'm curious, why is the company, or maybe they have, but uh, ever considered uh, franchising? Because all the stores are company owned, as I understand. No, that's incorrect. It's um, not? Okay. Yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, we started franchising fairly early in the game. Um, okay. Matter of fact, uh, my third mentor was actually the fellow who, um, his name is Lib Julian, Charles Lilburn Julian. He was an ex-pro baseball player with the, with the Dodgers organization, caught Drysdale and Koufax. Okay, okay. And uh, um, so Lib actually came into the business and started, um, you know, doing our franchise effort. <clears throat> the first franchisee, was a fellow named Bill Johnson and, uh, and his partner, Glenn Collis. Uh, Bill is out of the business now. Collis is still in and has a very successful franchise in North Georgia and parts of Tennessee. Um, but, uh, and Johnson, by the way, took all the money that he made in the Waffle House business and bought the Ritz-Carlton of Boston and turned it into the Ritz-Carlton chain, which he sold to Marriott for a dollar or two, <laughs> um, but we we sold those franchises. Um, I didn't. I wasn't around at the time, and it was almost more trouble than it was worth. You, you had great franchisees, but the bad ones were just too difficult to manage, particularly at that point in our history. Right. We didn't have a real solid um, franchise management and control team. And uh, so the end of the story is we just didn't do exclusive territory franchises for 25 years. Okay. But <clears throat> at one point, um, if you read Ray Kroc's founder of McDonald's book, mm -hmm. Grinding It Out, he said that the best mix is 60% um, uh, company and 40% franchise. Um, and that's 
probably where we were several years ago. But as the, our franchisees have interested out and aged out, we have absorbed, even though we didn't intend to, a lot of the franchises and now it's probably 80% company and 20% and franchise. Could a person still get a franchise? The only way that you can get a Waffle House franchise is to be an active employee of Waffle House or an active employee of an existing franchise. We, I mean, the, the list and the line of, of uh, people who would like to buy a Waffle House franchise is long and distinguished. I, I, yeah, I believe it. But um, <clears throat> our franchisees are tied to the business. The, the checkbook in your pocket is directly tied to the checkbook, the, the company checkbook. And we find that, that, that when things line up like that, um, there's a lot more skin in the game and people pay attention to the business. So if you or I, for example, were running a division, which would be about nine restaurants in, in the Waffle House parent company, and we petitioned for a franchise, um, given our performance, if it was great, uh, then we would be given a franchise, but we would start one level down at the district with three. Okay. Or one. Okay. That you never get exactly what you had because that's a little too much to start with. But yes, we do have uh, franchises. We've got we've got a bunch of them, probably fifty or sixty, and there are a lot of onesie twosies okay. that are very very successful. When you get to to the level you were at, what's the most challenging part of your job, chief operating officer of the company? Well, it's always the people. Um, when I got that job, um, we had 600 company restaurants, and I went through the ranks and found four people that were qualified to run a division, meaning nine restaurants. The difference between running a, a restaurant or a three-unit district uh, and running a division is the difference between tactics and strategy. You know, uh, at the at the one and three unit level, it's it's boots on the ground, get the job done, um, keep the keep the restaurant right, keep the food right, and and keep everybody happy. And um, at the division level, it, it's a little more strategy, um, planning ahead and making sure that you uh, are looking toward the future. To answer your question specifically, I had, I had uh, four people that fit that bill and probably needed 40. Hmm. So that was the first big job, was to put together a, a development effort that found the right folks, got them well trained, and then got them developed into uh, senior positions. That was the most difficult job. I had to do flipping eggs and turning hamburgers. You know, it doesn't take a college degree to do that. But to but to put together that kind of of a development plan was was a challenge. Yeah. I want to get to something a little lighthearted here as we as we roll towards the end of the program. Here, I have probably less than five minutes. Um, Burt's Chili. It's named after you. How did how did that come about? <laughs> well, it's my creation, but it wasn't my idea. Okay. I was I was. Uh, living in Dallas, Texas, actually Grapevine, Texas, uh, and running the restaurants west of the Mississippi when Joe Rogers, Jr., um, came out and said, hey, um, you're in the chili capital of the world here in Dallas. I need for you to put together a good chili recipe because at that time, if you were uh, crazy enough to order chili in a Waffle House, we just scooped it out of a can and heated it up for you. <laughs> so he said, well, you put together that recipe, and I said, being sound of mine, I said, yes, sir, I'd be happy to do that for you. Uh, worked on it for a year, put it in, and it was an overnight home run, Jeff. It was just, it just took off. <clears throat> Matter of fact, it was the base, the frozen base was taking up so much space in the freezers that it was denying space for the meats. <clears throat> so I had to reformulate it for a freeze-dried mix and put all the ingredients in in the restaurant. Scared to death when we 
introduced that, uh, I knew I gotten it close, but the sales went up 22%. And so I picked up a menu one day and my name was next to it. And I called Joe and I said, what, what have you done? And he said, well, it was, it was for a job well done, but I think the truth is he just wanted somebody to supervise the quality of the chili for the rest of his life, because if your name is on it, you will taste it everywhere you go. <laughs> I bet you do, I bet you do. Is that your favorite item? Uh, actually, my favorite item is the chicken sandwich. Really? Yeah, now, my wife's favorite item is the chili. She okay. puts it on a salad. Okay. But, yeah, but I like, I, I don't think you can beat our, our chicken as a, uh, whole boneless breast of marinated chicken, grill not fried, skinless, low cal, seasoned, not hot, but seasoned on a, on a chicken sandwich with a little Thousand Island dressing. That's as close to heaven as I may get for a while. <laughs> I'll tell you what's really good too are the hash browns, especially if you get them a little extra crispy. Scatter's mother cover chunk, dice top, pepper cap, and country. That's the way I like it. <laughs> That's good. That's good stuff. Uh, just a couple minutes left. Uh -huh. I'm a young person. I'm fresh out of college. I want to climb the ranks of business in, in, in a minute or so. Your best advice? Well, my best advice is to sit down and, and figure out what you really want out of life. I mean, most people just stand on the corner and, and take the first bus that comes along. Then when they get unhappy, uh, they get off that bus and take the next bus that's painted a different color. Uh, you have to be a lot more thoughtful about it and, and it's really tough for kids, uh, and I say kids, young men and women, uh, right out of college. The first thing you need to do is find a mentor who can help you sort through what you're really looking for. Um, do you want to get into the world of finance like you are, or do you want to get into the restaurant industry like I was, um, or do you uh, just want to build diesel engines for a living? Mm -hmm. Um, so you find somebody to sit down and walk you through how to make those choices. And then uh, you just tie your shirt tail to a star and bloom where you're planted. What a pleasure to talk to you. My Enjoyed pleasure. it. Thank you, sir. Bert Thornton, the name of his book is Find an Old Gorilla, and it's all about mentoring. I would encourage you to pick it up. How, how would one go about getting Amazon and all those? You can. Uh, I recommend the soft cover version okay. because the people who who have done that tell me they make notes in the margin, underline things, and use it up, use it as a reference. Just okay. put it in the corner of the desk. But you can get it, and you go to Lulu Publishing, okay. Lulu.com, right. and uh, do a search on it, and you can get it at Amazon and Kindle as well. Awesome. Congratulations. Barnes and Noble too. Well, wonderful. Much success to you, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate the time. A, our, our absolute pleasure. By the way, you can see more of our conversations online at WSRE.org slash conversations as well as on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.